Ryan, can yeah. I, is okay? Mm. Yeah. No, just because it follows on. Um, yeah. Can I just say the general um, approach I think we need to take is that this country really turns and changes when we're all working in a certain direction. We need to triple the level of ambition of our climate action in the same way we've just tripled the price for carbon in our public procurement assessment in the political system. And I think we need to triple our level of investment in this issue in our public administrative system. And if we do that together, collectively, we can turn things around in this country. We're showing we're good at it. Uh, I suppose the first question I have, if, you, if I can, uh, Chairman, is, Mr. Watt, Mr. Watt, Rob, Robert, what is your role, what's the role of your department in the assessment or the drafting of the new Energy and Climate Action Plan that we have to do under EU governance? So that's led by, that's led by uh, the Department, Department of Climate. Uh, so we will be involved with them in helping them assessing the options uh, based on the public spending code, the options that we believe will deliver abatement at the lowest cost. So we will be engaged in, in conversations and discussions. And I think one of the challenges we have, Deputy, is to actually beef up the capacity. I think you're aware of the IGES work that we've been doing, the papers that we've been publishing, which tries to improve our analytical capacity. And that's what it comes down to. There are lots of options out there. And people talk about, you know, that option will, will lead to emissions reductions. I mean, you actually investigate it. It doesn't deliver or it's too expensive. So what will actually work? What will actually make an impact? So our role, Deputy, will be involved with, with working with the department in assessing options that come from them and from the other, the other options and engaging, hopefully, in a, in a constructive discussion about uh, those options that should be put to government then for decision. You said earlier on correctly that we know already now that there's at least a 100 million tonne gap in what we need to do in the next decade, the next 12 years, and the potential cost of not closing that gap is at least 3.2 billion, could be up to 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 billion, depending on the price of carbon. Have you seen in that role you have, that responsibility you have to assess the options of how you close the gap, have you, seen from, have you received from the other department details of what those options might be? No. So the work, the work, so so first of all, I didn't say that it would be three billion or six billion. Whichever. I, yeah. Okay. Just clarifying that. My nice headline. Uh, I didn't say that, but I said it will be. There's 100 million, and we likely don't know what the price. three plus. We don't know what the price is. Uh, but no, we, we, I think, uh, and I think you've, you've got this from your discussions already with Secretary General that we don't have the options worked through. We don't have all the options worked through that, that, that establish what, what are what are the decisions we have to take uh, in this area. We've got some ideas, of course. We've got. The, the project 2040, which have ideas, we've got views about carbon tax and future pricing, but we don't have the full the full suite uh, of measures, and that work is that work is ongoing. And before that's the key you, challenge that we face. Before you came in, and this is working in a collaborative way, and I'm not trying to be smart. We made a decision here as a committee that we were going to write to all the sector generals and in, to help our work, and acknowledging that the government and the state has to have its first draft answer to that question by Christmas. Mm -hmm. So to assist us in work, we were going to write to all the sector generals to say, could you, by the 30th of November, provide us what options are on the table in your mind and how much carbon abatement they would be and what sort of timelines would they be? Because that would assist us, Minister Bruton's coming in, I think, on the 5th of December. Could you, because you have that coordinating central role, make sure that the other departments, and indeed your own, provide this committee with that sort of detailed options paper for the 30th of November? Yeah, I don't know whether they'll have it ready by then, but I know the work is ongoing. Uh, we'll Given see we have to do this for in. Europe for Christmas, and we've known for three years the European government's package was agreed by government in October 2014, and I've seen the departments, both departments, I've seen you work up close, providing analysis in a really heroic way, and short timelines, I'm saying we need that sort of level of ambition and heroic endeavour here, so that by the 30th of November, so that in advance of Christmas, it's not that far away Christmas, we can look at some of the options. If we could commit to that. Can I say just one other question? The National Development Plan, we know already from the modelling that's been done, doesn't close the gap. In fact, everything it does in my mind, or a lot of what it does, takes us in the wrong direction, or it doesn't take us far enough. If I can just a couple of examples. We've heard here about the importance of retrofitting, and it's a brilliant investment. It's the lowest cost of abatement curve. I can tell you in advance there's an endless amount of reports I could wheel out to show retrofitting of energy efficiency buildings is the lowest cost of carbon. We have a four billion figure in the, in the budget for that. Andrew McDowell, the head of the EIB, was in Dublin last week saying it's a 50 billion budget that we need. John Fitzgerald said, was here saying, for the social housing alone, we had a five billion budget. The OPW were saying here, we're nowhere near meeting 
our energy efficiency targets in public buildings, and the so numbers that were mentioned here in your presentation today aren't even are a minute percentage of what we should be doing. So that four billion figure ain't going to be enough. We're going to have to change the national development plan. Similarly, in transport, I have to say to you, I'm speaking maybe as a Dublin person here. What's going on in transport is an absolute crime. It's a continuation, Mr. Watt, of what you said about our sprawl, because in Dublin, we're widening the N11, widening the N7, widening the N6, widening the N4, widening the N3, widening the N2. What you said absolutely correctly, that our big problem is the sprawl model. The National Planning Framework said the right thing, we're going to move away from it. The National Development Plan forgot that, threw it out. The only thing we're building this year are roads. We've no public transport project been built. We've not a single cycling project been built. Same again next year. It has to change. Similarly, there's nothing about forestry in the National Development Plan. Similarly, there's nothing about new circular economy in the National Development Plan. Do you agree that if we're going to be serious about this climate task we have, that the National Development Plan is going to have to change? So I, I don't agree with the, the characterisation of the plan in relation to uh, public transport. I think there are significant investments there planned in relation to bus connect, cycleways, uh, the metro. Uh, and as you know, Deputy, within Dublin, it's about the future planning of the Dublin that we have, uh, a model of development of unplanned urban sprawl, which is not sustainable. It's not sustainable from a congestion perspective or, or, or climate perspective, and that needs to change. And I think a very significant development over the last number of months is the Land Development Agency, where the government sets out its plans to, to enable much more compact development. And I think a key part of Project 2040 is that there is an alignment between a spatial view, a land view of the country, and the capital plan. And I do believe they're, uh, they do believe they're aligned. Of course, we can do more, and we shall see as the, as the plan has been implemented uh, how we can support the objectives of having a much more compact city. If In relation to retrofitting, uh, the plan sets out uh, a significant investment programme, which is a start, which is on its way, uh, and we shall see. Nobody would underestimate or downplay the enormous challenge we have in terms of retrofitting. I think 88% of our houses were built before uh, we had the energy, the, the, the rating system in place. Uh, we have got significant challenges and the costs, the costs are there. We discussed them already today about the cost of different installations and different options. How we fund this will be a mix of uh, tax incentives, uh, tax increases to incentivise people to take the retrofitting, uh, direct exchequer grants, uh, loan guarantees, low cost funding, a variety of, a variety of different options. Uh, and there's no doubt that as we start this retrofitting program and as we see how we're going, uh, that we have to look at other, other instruments, other mechanisms to accelerate the program. If, if I but I don't, but, I don't, but I, don't, I don't think, like for a plan, a plan, my view is that the Project 2040 is, is the right plan in terms of the ambition. Uh, the types of initiatives. There's a strong focus on compact cities, and it's a question of us actually delivering on that. And if I think that's a big change, <coughs> Deputy, from where if we I, were before. Two other questions. Really if I was in government tomorrow, I'd be switching all that road spending, widening the roads to Dublin, which is going to make the more difficult task for bus connects and yeah. spending on that public transport. And if I was, I'd also be commissioning Bordemona to lead out and go out buy, get them to buy 10,000 heat pumps so we get a better price and a whole uh, apprenticeship for young people in the Midlands to, to start retrofitting a house. But can I ask two other questions? if I can, Sharon. Firstly, I agree with you with the governance issue. Um, I think it has to belong to the centre of the state. You can't tell the government or you can't tell what to do. Although the wording in the uh, Citizens' Assembly was saying, not just new, but it said, or else improve or resource the existing independent bodies. So I would resource the Climate Advisory Committee more. I would have a Just Transition Commission. I would have a Green Investment Bank. I would, there's loads of ways you can do it. But I believe you're right, the centre has to be where this responsibility lies. Would, and we made this submission in our submission to the consultation paper on Monday. Should we not change the delivery board to being a climate action delivery board? Should we not get Mark Griffin in as co-chair with you and recognise that we put climate at the centre of our whole decision-making process? And it's that body has a responsibility because that's where the power lies, working with other departments. Would you make that change in and the government structure? And your second question as well, Deputy. Just uh, second, okay, second question is, I would ask Mr Moran, <clears throat> if you could, by the 30th of November, in the same way I've asked Mr Watt, to come back to this committee with an analysis of how we would introduce a cap and dividend scheme on the additional carbon tax that we would rise. Assuming that we would put another 20 euro 
carbon tax in the existing way we have of charging it, but that we would, we would return the revenue to the citizens in just the way that Senator uh, O'Sullivan has set out. Could you, and if, if you have to get the yes right to do it with you, fine, but could you do a paper to assist us in our writing our paper on, how, on the implications, costs, opportunities, obstacles in that process? Thank you. I might bring in Mr Watt first. Yep, I don't disagree with you on the heat pumps or the, 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 the widening the roads either. Uh, in relation to the, 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 the question, uh, yeah, like it, it, it might be a, a structural change is to have uh, the SecGen group uh, chaired by Mark who, who takes that responsibility. Yeah, that, that, might, that might be uh, something which is uh, comparable to the governance structure we have in for the delivery board. Yeah, no, that, you know, replace the delivery board. Uh, replace the delivery board. Like the, uh, the minister says he wants a job action plan type thing. Well, that should be the job action plan centre of it. Mm. Um, Mr. Moran. Let me see what we can do. Um, I think you referred to our heroic efforts in the past. See if we can... I've seen it, and, and you can do it. I, I faith. Can I last one last point? Just comment on the question. Brief, brief, brief. The, brief, briefly. Mr. Watt is right in terms of it's still political responsibilities where the responsibility lies in the end, and, and so we have a responsibility. But it's interesting when you cited examples. You cited ministers Howland, Noonan, and O'Donoghue, three finance ministers. Everyone knows who's been in government, that the reality is that's where the power is. And you as an energy or as an agriculture or as a transport minister have to get over that obstacle. And it has been an obstacle in getting to decarbonisation. There was always a sense that you were fighting, that they didn't quite understand in the Department of Finance and Public Expenditure and Reform that decarbonisation is actually an economic opportunity for this country, that we can and will be good at it, that this is where the new economy is going, that retrofitting is not a burden, it's not a high risk. But that has to change. That we have to give power to some of the line ministers and indeed local authorities and mayors so that everyone in this country gets the chance to experiment and show off how we can actually make this shift. Well, That's one briefly, of the changes that very has to happen. Briefly, it, was, it was referring to uh, Deputy, Deputy Pringle's suggestion that perhaps there were civil servants around the country. That's what I was suggesting that uh, Deputies Howland and Noon should be brought in to, to give their view on that. Uh, but seriously, in relation to, I don't disagree on the opportunities. I don't disagree with that at all, and uh, I think from the contributions we made this afternoon, I think you probably got a sense that we believe we believe the urgency of this challenge and the scale of this challenge, and it is it's going to involve an enormous uh, change to our society, and that will provide enormous opportunities. It will involve difficult decisions, and it will involve some sectors that will will go into decline, but there will be other sectors that will grow and prosper, and I don't I don't see it. Uh, at all just negatively. I see quite the opposite. I think there will be great opportunities, but it will involve, uh, it will involve the, the, the pain of transition, and I think we need to be upfront about some of those issues, and we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't duck them. But I, I, but I, don't, see it, I don't see it as entirely as negative. I think it's an, it's an opportunity for future sectors to grow and prosper and provide employment. Mr so, Moran, briefly. You know, very briefly, yeah. I do agree with the mm -hmm. urgency of this, and um, we, we need to move on. We made certain progress around, and um, particular to talk about um, um, things like carbon tax and, 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 and the carbonisation of, of how we treated um, um, vehicle registration some time ago, but we need to move forward from that. We've been sort of stuck 